What is up, down, and sideways, all you beautiful individuals? Welcome to another episode of League Unlock. My name is Eric. Thank you for joining us, and I gotta tell you, Mark and I have been very critical, harsh on this new LCS schedule, but I'm getting used to these games in the middle of the week, happening Wednesday, Thursday. It breaks up the competitive uh, schedule a little bit because weekends used to always be so jam-packed with games, it was hard to even get through all of the action. But now having it in the middle of the week, not bad, not bad, especially when we're getting more and more actually exciting matches in the LCS. So I'm, I'm coming around to it, to these weekday, uh, middle of the week matches. But today, before we get to all that LCS action, of course, we had the first day of LPL playoffs kicking off with Uzi and the boys at EDG matching up against World Elite. And I must say, the theme in this entire series, really, was come from behind. You know, comebacks into games that you weren't expecting. And none of it was more evident than in the final game. Because this looked like we were primed and ready for a little Silver Scrapes Game 5 action. World Elite had almost an 8K gold lead. And then it's just... I mean, you can call it being lackadaisical or you can call it being some primo team fighting out of EDG. I think it's a little bit of both. And listen, these double AD carry comps with especially the Ivern, which I'm going to start calling pretty broken on the Rift as we've seen it in multiple regions, multiple players pilot it. But look at this. Orn, Ivern, Alistair, and then just two AD carries. We're talking the meatball comp plus dual carry threat. Multiple times you saw, I mean, this one fight, you see both Uzi and Fofo survive, and that's, that's it. That's GG when both those AD carries are able to survive. And then even around the Baron with EDG still at a deficit, when Uzi gets caught out, kind of abandoned by his team. But look how long he survives with this Ivern shielding plus redemption, but he does go down. But oh, wait! There's a second 80 carry that you gotta rely on. Uh, so Baron goes over to them and I mean, it's it's over from there. A couple of team fights get EDG back into this game. Their team fighting across the entire series was pretty rock solid, but this, it's wild to have a series where honestly three out of the four games probably uh, went to the team that you wouldn't expect to be winning. It went to the squad uh, that was behind and ended up having a not miraculous, but impressive comeback as EDG take it three to one, barely even have an even uh, gold lead with EDG as they're pushing down on the Nexus. They just take the gold lead back uh, or gold advantage over their way as they win three one. They're gonna advance uh, to match up into the next round against, I believe, OMG, who is, is who they're gonna be matching up against. Uzi had a pretty solid performance. Him and Mako, Mako especially on the Nautilus in this series. Uzi highlighted him in the post game, uh, talking about how good he was on that pick specifically. His hooks were absolutely nasty throughout. Fofo looked great on the Tristana in that fourth game especially. But when you look at the rest of this series, the guy to absolutely highlight is Ale in the top lane. We had, you saw him on Orn in game four, which... Hard to be popping off on that pick. But again, credit to him. Shows that he can play both these carries and uh, tanks. Orn has been a pick that he's actually been pretty good on for a couple of years now on EDG. But the Jax and the Fiora in this series were the absolute standouts. Game 3 was the only game in this series that was a stomp. And of course, it was in the favor of EDG. So I think across the board, EDG was definitely the better team. Um you know, throughout the entire series, even in that second game, which they ended up dropping to EDG, it was very much, they, they should have won. They should have, could have, would have, I know it's in hindsight now, but EDG across the board looked much better really in this series than they have in the regular season, despite World Delete playing a little bit better than they did as well to close things out as we know they had a pretty sizable slump heading into this playoff round but uh the advantages that Ale was getting single-handedly in those first three games didn't matter if it was the jacks or it was the fiora he let's be honest completely manhandled cube in pretty much all of their matchups throughout even on that orn when uh, a lot of the attention was Going the way of Cube, all a complete top gap throughout this series. Uh, JJ, on more of these supportive junglers, has actually been looking 
pretty solid. I know we're accustomed to seeing him on carry-centric junglers uh, when they were winning Worlds EDG back in 2021, but he's been he's been thriving, surviving on some of these more stable, supportive picks. It helps again when this gotta talk about it double 80 carry. It's becoming an absolute menace. You've seen Lucian come mid from Caps uh, on G2. Obviously, the Tristana is the most common one. The Kaisa in the mid lane, even though I know she's played AP because Static Shiv is absolutely busted still. But it's it's kind of the new wave meta where you have three beefy boys and then these two dual carry threats. And we'll see which teams can, you know, excel in that role the best with that. Right now, it's definitely... Uh, well, Fofo and Uzi are pretty damn good at it. It's the first playoffs out of Uzi that we've seen since 2019, I think. I mean, he didn't make it on BLG, that's for sure. So since he retired the first time, and I think there were definitely moments where you could see shades of the confidence, just not getting hit by any single skill shot. But um, the veteran leadership of Aiko and Uzi, definitely uh, the standout for EDG in this one. There's still gonna be underdogs, I think, uh, in that OMG matchup as they should be because OMG is the total opposite of World Elite coming into these playoffs. They were on a roll, three different series wins in a row to close out their final week of action. Whereas, as we know, World Elite was uh, slumping big time. But I think everybody, myself included, is, is rooting for this EDG squad, not just because Uzi is on the roster and you want to see as many games out of him as possible because who knows if he's going to be coming back next year. I would say probably not, but of course... Who knows? Things can change. But right now, things looking good for EDG kicking off the LPL playoffs. LCS side of things, we did have a lot of... Now, all these matches are important as we head into the final week of regular season action for seeding. And, of course, just making it to playoffs for some of these squads. And, well, CounterLogic Gaming may no longer be with us in the LCS. Their heart and their spirit lives on through NRG. Case in point. Matching up against Cloud9, a matchup. Now, NRG, four wins in a row coming into this. You maybe thought they had a chance against Cloud9, and they had more than a chance in this one as they come away. With the big ol' upset against the boys, especially when Cloud9 had a decent pre-20-minute game. Had almost a 2k gold lead, but last week we were highlighting Dokla on the Gangplank finally coming alive. It was more of it. On the Cassante today, he had some nasty engages and some insane ulties dodging all kinds of cc but again it's the team fighting the highlight out of nrg this one around the baron to really get the game rolling in their uh, possession as you see berserker try to make a little one before outplay gets them all nice and low but it's not enough there's the unstoppable out of dokla completely blocking and negating the poppy ulti as all of a sudden that one baron quickly snowballed into a 4k plus gold lead for NRG, and then for Team Fight Masterclass as Berserker. Look, he stays alive. Okay, now we're left with kind of a 3v4, but that ends up being the Dragon and Soul over to NRG. And then the big contest is Pal Palafox is soloing Emenez, who had a bit of a rough game. And then Cloud9, you tunnel on the Elder. You forget about the LeBlanc with Static Shiv who and Lich Bane, who's absolutely... Look at the damage on these turrets. It's like three-shotting them. And Berserker finally tries to back, but it's a little bit too late. It's an easy, uncontested closeout for Palafox. Five in a row for NRG now. And again, this brings up everyone talking about Cloud9 because... As we've seen internationally, and it's a tale as old as time with the top LCS squads... They don't get tested. They don't get punished enough when they make mistakes in North America. And then they go in the international scene. And boy, you really get punished by the LPL, LEC, and LCK squads. Saw that for this Cloud9 at MSI. Maybe going to see it at Worlds. But at least they're getting punished here in the regular season. It's, it's not just... Uh, 
hands diff and just out team fighting, out playing skirmishes for Cloud9 doesn't work in this NRG uh, matchup, which again is good when these top teams are finally being uh, tested and taken down. And listen, five losses already for Cloud9. They've been tested multiple times, but NRG, man, they are ripping and roaring, heading towards playoffs with the longest active win streak in the LCS. Their win streak is longer than the total wins for FlyQuest coming into their matchup. We know it's all about a miracle run for them. Need minimum a 2-1 final week in the regular season, but 3-0 and is what will really put them into the at least sort of driver's seat going forward. And there's one guy in the LCS who we know comes online when it's playoff time. And we can basically call playoff starting now for FlyQuest because Big Daddy Impact in the matchup against TSM. No other LCS player do you see. 1v4 scenarios and the guy gets two kills and escapes. It's not on the Shen this time. It's on the Rumble, but Impact was on a different level this game against the TSM squad that's looked good as of late. It looked like Spring Split FlyQuest, guys. Yes, I'm gonna call it. It's not just because Spica was paying a moo, moo in this one, but Prince looking solid on the Kai'Sa. Truthfully, he didn't really have to do very much because you have a 6K gold lead at 20 minutes, mostly thanks to Impact getting so much pressure across the map. Vulcan actually able to make some plays, which I feel like we've only seen a handful of times in these 11 games for FlyQuest. And this, this is positive signs. This is absolutely how you wanted to see this squad start their final week of regular season action. It's still a long road ahead for them. And if they want that 3-0, Cloud9's on the schedule for them. They have a matchup against Immortals, which absolutely needs to be a win for them. And the Cloud9 one, if you want to make playoffs, you got to compete with the very best. So... FlyQuest, you got your work cut out for you if you do want to be making some noise. But playing at this level, it makes me feel sad if they don't make playoffs. Uh, I know TSM is still a middle of the pack, not quite a top tier squad in the LCS, but consistency is all we've been asking and waiting for for FlyQuest. And this is going to be the one-off time that the eight seed playoffs is a positive and, you know, we're going to get a maybe at best 7-11 and 11 squad that you feel like is actually better than their record dictates. So, strong start for FlyQuest with a 1-0 start in this Week 6 action in the regular season. And their biggest competitors for that final spot in playoffs is, of course, going to be Dignitas and 100 Thieves who matched up on the Rift. Dig not looking good coming into this matchup. 100 Thieves at least ended last week on a high note. So I think most people would have been expecting 100 Thieves to show up and book a playoff spot. But it was all Dig all day, especially in that early game. The Ziggs mid lane for Jensen. Rich on the Cassante and it was really just rough across the board early for 100 Thieves. In the mid game, 30 minutes now down, almost 4K. It's someday doing his best to drag the corpse of his teammates into playoffs single-handedly on the Gwen as he almost really pops off in that fight. But it goes the way of 100 Thieves. They get back into this game. Now it's barely a 1K gold lead. These Zix bombs were doing absolutely disgusting damage. But now the Elder goes over the dig. Rich is having a field day with that buff, shooting lasers across to Quid, who had a bit of a rough performance. And that is the closeout from there. I mean, it took maybe 20 minutes longer than people were expecting because dig was so unbelievably in control early on but they booked themselves a playoff ticket and now six and ten for a hundred thieves the road gets a whole lot more difficult to head towards playoffs for them and the anomaly the mystery the enigma that is closer continues because for a guy who for multiple splits, multiple years in a row in the LCS, we were talking about him as not just a premier jungler, top three in the league. He was a perennial MVP candidate. And that has just not shown up whatsoever in this LCS split. I know a lot of people were harping on the Maokai build in this, but to to me, the bigger concern is this guy seems to only be able to play Maokai. The falloff for him has been absolutely incredible and I think is 
At the top of the list of issues for 100 Thieves, there's a lot more to look at as well. Busio in lane has been a liability the last couple of weeks. It really feels like we're still waiting for the development out of Clit. It's someday and Doublelift kind of trying to drag this team. And even Doublelift didn't have the most standout performance in this matchup against Tobo and Poom, who theoretically is one of the weaker bot lanes in the LCS and 100 Thieves were not at all able to take advantage of that so a tough road ahead now for 100 Thieves if they want to be making playoffs with this hopefully momentous FlyQuest squad trying to ride that momentum into a playoff berth themselves it's it's going to be a spicy finish and I didn't think we'd ever have a spicy playoff race finish for an eight team playoff bracket but here we are uh, with the squad like FlyQuest hopefully trying to save their season and same for 100 Thieves, both squads that we expected to be near the very top of the table. Another big marquee matchup because two teams, two of the top three teams, if you're talking about our rankings for the LCS, Team Liquid versus Golden Guardians. And much like we saw Impact on the Rumble completely popping off, we had similar levels from Summit. The problem is Team Liquid was not able to snowball or do anything with a rumble that had such an absolutely disgusting advantage. And the other problem is River is an absolute menace and has been for the entire split. And if you're asking me, should be number one on your MVP ballot for the summer split. He goes deathless on the Viego in this one and any team fight, any skirmish where it looked like Team Liquid was going to find an avenue back into this game. It was River time and time again getting resets on the Viego. Always as busted 205,000 years champion as he is. It's always a treat to see the mechanical gods play that pick. And he's diving in 1v4. Doesn't even care on the Viego because it's, again, a little bit disgusting. But flashes in for the reset onto Stixay. Doesn't even want to take the Aphelios because he's too cool for school. Wants to go into the GA, but ends up being, look at this, 8k plus gold lead for Gold Guardians. It's a sub 30 minute win as they're able to close it out. And most surprisingly, I think so far, this split for Golden Guardians, last year and through MSI, everything, all the stuff we were talking about was Stixay. Yes, Gory was a first team all pro mid laner and a guy in his own right in the MVP conversation in spring, but we were talking about Stixay nonstop and he has been, I don't want to say underwhelming, but under the radar at the very least, maybe the third fourth, fifth, even at times, guy you're talking about on this GG roster because River, again, should be getting MVP. Gory is obviously probably the second vote you have. That mid-jungle duo has absolutely been the standout performers for Golden Guardians across the board. Now that Rel is one of the most meta picks support and in the jungle, who he is thriving and having a good time on an engaged champion like that, things are looking real good for Golden Guardians with Cloud9 being a little bit shaky over the last week or so. This last week looks like that final push for Golden Guardians to be that top team and the team you're feeling the best about as we roll into playoffs. Case in point, this matchup against Team Liquid. We've been feeling concerned, fraudulent accusations going the way of the evil geniuses. Apparently, management, coaching staff thinking maybe our mayo was the cause for this uh, losing streak, which I think you'd be a little bit insane to think that was the main cause for concern, but I digress. Shaden gets his LCS debut start against Immortals. They want to lob him a softball to kick things off for him. He plays the poppy in this matchup, and first off, it's only Immortals, so we're not going to get excited whatsoever, but EG looked much, 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 much better more like their first four week form or three and a half week form uh, as this game just I mean they had some of the most disgusting gold leads early on when they were dominating and we got to see that here a Baron already at 20 minutes and uh, revenge on the Gwen it's getting 2v 1v3 double kills and Playing at a high level on that. JoJo is landing charms everywhere. He had almost a 20 CS lead single-handedly. The Vigar pick did not quite work out. Unforgiven, a team fighting menace. EG getting back on the board, but still, I remember the four game losing streak that just happened and a win against 
immortals who I think now FlyQuest trying to surge towards the end. 100 Thieves, even in their current form. Immortals are clearly the weakest team in the LCS. And Kenvi is, well, I'm not going to say the worst jungler in the LCS because unfortunately Closer takes that title. But Shaden gets a win in his uh, debut. You heard Kelsey Moser talking about, who's the head of the coaching staff for EG. It sounds like it's just this Immortals match that we're going to be seeing him. So I don't know if Armeo's going to be playing the final two games of the regular season. I don't know if they just wanted to get shade in some uh, stage time or wanted to light the fire under Armeo and the rest of EG. Sometimes that all, all it takes is seeing that your spot is vulnerable and you will be benched if you continue to lose. That can maybe not only inspire Armeo, but the rest of the EG roster to kind of refocus and get things fine-tuned for playoffs. Either way, the losing streak is over. They pick up their double-digit 10th win for EG. Of course, they've already locked playoffs a couple weeks ago, but starting to recorrect after uh, that losing streak, but still not feeling much better against EG. We got to see how they play the rest of that week six action. LCK, the match to talk about. Sorry, DRX Nongshim. It's not you guys. It is the Kwangdong Freaks against Gen G ahead of their marquee matchup against KT. Rolls to the two top teams in the LCK. I was ready for the hype to slowly be derailed because Kwangdong hands Gen G their first loss of the regular season. It didn't end up happening, but. We will give huge credit to CV Max as he's watching his former prodigy in Chovy and Doran popping off on Genji. But the Kwangdong freaks absolutely gave Genji everything they could handle in this series. Both games, really, even though it was a 2 0 in the favor of Genji. The first game in particular, oh man. They had avenues, they had moments, they had. They had Dudu trying to do his best. They had Taeyun on the Aphelios doing everything that he could, but it ends up being Delight just finding a couple of picks on the Blitzcrank. Back-to-back, -back. Peanut is stealing a Hextech Drake to deny the soul, and Pays is on a very fed Kaisa in the late game as Taeyun's getting blown up. Red, white, we don't mind a fight because you're dying in three hits from these Kaisa Ws. Look at that score line for Pays. Double digit kills, only one death, and he even gets the perfect stopwatch at the end to close things out as it ends up being an ace. But 48 minute game, Genji needed in that first matchup, and game two, it was more of Kwangdong forcing. Look at the gold lead. Even just being even with Genji post 20 minutes is impressive enough, but the Baron ends up going uh, over to Peanut, even though. Bulldog is trying his best on the Cassiopeia and Dudu. Dudu's the guy to talk about in this series because he's getting solo kills across the board on the Jacks. He had a good first game as well. Kind of manhandled a Doran that we were talking about as maybe the second best top laner in the LCK right now. But Dudu absolutely had a field day. But anytime you get to see Chovy on the Tristana, it's always a treat, especially when he's not jumping in 1v4 and dying. Check out this buster shot mid jump, denying Doo Doo any access into this team fight as the rest of the boys are able to clean it up. Pays, how many times do we see this guy surviving sub 100 health and knowing exactly how and when he's able to jump in and take over a fight? Pays is one of the most treats of an 80 carry to watch when it comes to team fighting and genji rolls on to 13 and 0 but kdf be proud be proud of the fight that you put up against this absolute war machine that is genji we're gonna get the 13 and 0 squad matching up against kt over the weekend can't wait to see it but that is it today for league unlock my name is eric thank you to all you beautiful people for watching as always and we will catch you on that flippity flip